Signore e signori, buongiorno e benvenuti. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome on behalf of Italian Exhibition Group at Vicenza Oro and VO Vintage. So this new edition is an extraordinary one. It is the largest exhibition of our 69 years of history. So we have reached the biggest size so far. But we do not focus on volumes only, quite the contrary, because we are the jewelry boutique show. It is also becoming the watch show, but always in the spirit of the boutique quality selection. And it is in this direction that we have evolved in the past few years, reintroducing watches and clocks. Maybe some of you remember previous editions in the past, uh, I know that you've been working with watches for quite some time. So we used to have watches, then we didn't have any watches anymore. Now they're back with the uh, vintage. And downstairs, we also have the B2B exhibition with independent brands, micro brands, and the whole value chain with the accessories and the machines to produce watches. and. Another aspect we're very keen on is culture. That is, we believe that an exhibition is not just a place where you make business, where you buy and you sell. An exhibition must be the reference point for the whole industry. And as we like to say, we are a cultural hub, a platform sharing culture, ideas, understanding opportunities and trying to convert towards a joint target. And this is also the reason why we're here today. This marks a new start for Vicenza Oro. As you all know very well, Vicenza Oro has more than 1,300 companies in its different halls, 60% of which are Italian. So this is not a pure Italian exhibition, but the heart of this fair is made in Italy. So made in Italy is our heart, our core. And we would like this to become the core of watches as well. That is promoting our Italian heart at an international fair is what we've been doing for dozens of years for gold jewelry. And with this spirit, we would like to do this for watches. And we're very glad to host here today an unprecedented event. Um, and this talk, we're going to get to know about the roots of the Italian watchmaking. Um, we will explore the Italian role. And we're doing this with key opinion leaders, with the most knowledgeable people. Our super Dodigisan is going to help us chairing this event of L'Orologio. She doesn't need any introduction. And then we have some wonderful guests that Dodi is now going to introduce. Thank you very much, Dodi, and thank you very much to all of you for being here with us. Welcome to all of you. And as Marcus said, I'm Dodi Giussani, the director of the magazine L'Orologio. So we are here to talk about Italian watches and watchmaking. Marco has very well introduced the topic. And we have here with us a living encyclopedia, Professor Ugo Pantani, an expert in watchmaking and watches, trainer of the foundation of Horsologerie in Geneva. He will provide us with a historical introduction. Um, mentioning also the present Italian role in this industry. Then, Mr. Marco Mantovani, president of Lockman, sitting here next to me. This is one of the most important made in Italy brands, and we will explain why it is made in Italy and Swiss made, how these two different situations can be united. Then we have Sandro Frattini, collector of watches and watch expert, Carlo Fontana, our special guest star. Carlo Fontana has an experience in this industry. Um, 
He has a family tradition in this industry, and he has worked himself for several years in this industry. So we are going to tell you why today we can talk about Italian watches and watchmaking and why the time has come to talk about it again. So without further ado, I would like to leave the floor to Ugo. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I must admit that when I was invited to lecture about Italian clock making and to uh, go through uh, the history of clock making, in particular the Italians in this field, well, I was really happy. In the past uh, months, I uh, decided to uh, go deep into the subject, and I discovered many important secrets which I want to share with you. First of all, uh, Italy has been and still is the uh, protagonist of the birth of the mechanic clock. And here, there is a very important aspect to be considered. When was the mechanic clock created and where? I, um, I, you know, I used to be a teacher at the uh, watchmaking uh, school for 40 years in Florence. Uh, it's very difficult to say when uh, the uh, mechanic clock was uh, created and where. There are some documents in the archive which clearly show that it was already existing in Italy in uh, the 14th century. We know from other sources that maybe in 1275 the first uh, clocks had been built in the monasteries, but we have no documents reliable for that. Uh, you know, uh, it was uh, difficult when the term clock uh, or uh, time device, uh, it was uh, difficult to decide whether it was a sand clock or a meridian or, or whether it uh, used uh, uh, energy. And we have to quote Dante and the Divina Commedia. Um, there is a, a short clip uh, showing Dante uh, see, watching the mysterious movement of the souls in paradise. This document has been uh, uh, displayed here to uh, show what uh, Dante saw. Here we see thousands of souls shining like stars. E meravigliosa sovrasta le capacità visive di Dante. E Beatrice gli spiega che si tratta della potenza trionfale di Cristo. Il poeta viene ridestato dal rapimento mistico dalla voce di Beatrice e teme di non essere in grado di tradurre in versi quella visione paradisiaca. E credi di non essere. And uh, Dante was afraid of not being able to put what he saw into verses. Often so Dante in the Divina Commedia. Uh, uses, um, like metaphors, uh, taken from the world of painting or, or sculpting. Here, a comparison is made. When he saw the movement of the souls, he's reminded of a clock. And you see the circles going around, and this is described by the verse, which is uh, uh, indicated in the slide. That uh, meant that when watching the souls turning, Dante was reminded of the turning around of the mechanisms of a clock, which confirms the presence of uh, clocks. 
in Italy, or rather in Tuscany, which is my region of origin. The uh, Tuscany region was one of the first places where mechanic clocks were manufactured. Interestingly, the tenth canto of Paradise, where Dante speaks about clocks, calling him when the sun rises. And he speaks about a, a very nice sound, tintin, coming from the clock. This is a ringing mechanism. This uh, clock is a replica from the 16th century. You have the little bell and the small uh, gears and the sound. Dante moved uh, in throughout Italy and he visited many monasteries from the uh, Benedict Friars. And uh, the motto was pray and work. At the beginning, they used sand uh, clocks. And so they were the first needing this sort of alarm clock to wake up the monks so that they could pray and work. And this is indeed evidence, as confirmed by the 10th canto. Uh, this is a, a clock uh, in the hands of a collector in Milan. This is another historical moment, a fresco by Botticelli uh, 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 in a church in Florence, and a detail of this uh, alarm clock in the monastery. We also have this big clock, which was defined as a miracle of mechanics. Uh, it uh, is a planetary clock made by Giovanni Dondi in 1364. And he did something unique uh, for uh, that period of history. Then we had. Uh, Brunelleschi, the one who designed the dome of the church in Florence. I don't know whether you uh, know uh, the history of Brunelleschi. He was a clock maker. In uh, the workshops of, of Florence, the culture of mechanics uh, was developed, like these uh, schools of engineering of modern times. And Brunelleschi uh, built or made uh, clocks and uh, uh, alarm clocks, which were called uh, destatori in ancient Italian, which uh, means waking up. We have the only uh, clock made by Brunelleschi, which is uh, preserved in uh, Scarperia, which is the uh, town of Knives. He was one of the first uh, to use uh, springs and coils. So there should be a connection between that and clocks. Uh, this is a, a, a tower clock built in 1445. And that uh, uh, was paid uh, 12 uh, gold uh, florins. We learn a lot from the account books of the, uh, of the uh, cross people, uh, which uh, were the uh, document where all the expenses were recorded. Certain um, instruments uh, used to build the dome were developed based on the mechanics of clocks. The uh, yard of uh, Brunelleschi 
was a, a very good one because not many people died because it was a very safe place. This is a, a church in Florence with the uh, tools used to make the dome. Paolo Uccello in the Cathedral of Florence uh, built this uh, uh, wonderful uh, clock face. Uh, uh, this is a masterpiece, and uh, many artists collaborated in the world of clock making. Leonardo da Vinci, you all know him. He also uh, gave a very important contribution to the world of clock making. He studied mechanisms which uh, were used uh, to regulate the tension of the springs. At uh, that time, when fully loaded, they were very strong. So they had systems to allow uh, um, variable strength so that uh, the uh, <coughs> strength could go down while uh, the spring was being uh, gradually unloaded. This is in a museum in Florence that has been restored. And we have this clock, uh, which is uh, functioning within the museum in Florence. The conoid clock uh, is another interesting uh, uh, example created by Leonardo da Vinci that was used as a, a, a force equalizer in uh, the present uh, uh, watch world. This uh, to give you an idea of the importance of the clockmaking uh, sector in uh, Italy. These are the uh, uh, clocks of the uh, Barocci family in Urbino. Uh, the De La Rovere, uh, family were customers of the uh, Barocci uh, brothers. As you see, when a painting uh, was uh, to be made, the owners wanted to uh, show off their clocks. Uh, it is uh, like we do today with our watches. It's like a, a status symbol or uh, to exhibit our own values. Uh, this is a, a painting of Eleonora Gonzaga de la Rover, Duchess of Urbino, with a wonderful clock in the background. It's a personal symbol of power. And this dates back to the 17th century. The Barocci uh, family also had Galileo Galilei as a customer. They uh, made uh, uh, many uh, calipers uh, for uh, Galileo Galilei. He uh, was one uh, studying the isophonism and uh, the importance of using the pendulum uh, that had been patented by a Dutch. Italians are not very good at having their inventions patented. Anyway, uh, let's try and avoid uh, having brilliant ideas being stolen. This is a, another important Italian. I uh, got uh, uh, down uh, names of uh, some of these masters in uh, the uh, uh, Campania region, we had the night clocks or this uh, Villa Croce made over the centuries. Uh, now, uh, what is interesting is that uh, uh, research um, indicated that Italians gave an important contribution to the development and the knowledge of clocks, uh, consigling uh, mechanics and art, and there were about 700 of them. Many masters uh, 
many uh, clockmakers uh, in the past were from Italy. In the 19th and 20th century, we have some manufacturing, like the Luigi Beccatini, uh, getting golden medals in Paris. Also, Giovanni Sgherlini revolutionized uh, pocket watches with this very specific one. But I would like to start with Binder in 1906, who opened up his own little shop on Lake Maggiore. And then the boiler Vetta, uh, the first, he was one of the first importers of Weiler Vetta with the Vinca flags, this amazing balance wheel constructed in such a way that it made the wristwatch more reliable. So that was a technical intuition, which of course made this brand particularly successful. Oh, the Braal that everybody knows today. Let's move on to 1935. I've been uh, investigating very closely this case, not because I was active already in 1935, but because later on I actually uh, carried out a specific study on this. So Giuseppe Panerai, 1935, making use of a Rolex watch, transformed it and made it suitable for a special uh, military department that carried out extreme enterprises. So Giuseppe Panerai made the watch suitable for this special military group. Uh, it was covered by a military secret. Later on, it was marketed, but this has been for a long time a big mystery of horology. And I got to know about this only in 1993, when finally the military secret was expired, just to give you an idea about this. What I've recently discovered, which is also very, very fascinating, is OISA, um, an Italian company, and ever since I started working in this field, I've always had a dream, which was that of uh, being proud of a top level Italian watch manufacturing. And this dream is actually coming true. Anyhow, OISA 1937, thanks to Domenico Morezzi, and we have the grandchild here. Well, in 50 years, he made 10 calibers and built four million watches and clocks. And the most interesting thing is that uh, uh, he developed uh, several brands and he was also supplying other manufacturing companies in Italy and abroad, including Switzerland, such as, for example, Nacar, Ancre and Aretta. So very often, Swiss watches are also due to our ingenuity. There are many similar interesting stories. Let's now move to the 50s, see how many companies uh, were active in this field. I've just made a short list of all those who produced dials and uh, boxes and components, arms, balance wheels, gemstones, and rubies, for instance. And then all the workshops where the different pieces were assembled. We're talking about the 50s. This is a wonderful picture. So fascinating. This is the Omega Manufacturing Company in 1967. And as you can see, in June 67, the Italian flag was installed. Uh, doesn't happen very frequently in Switzerland. But this was done to pay homage to the performance, the technical performance achieved by the Fontana factory in Sesto Calende that actually had built one million boxes. Later on, this became five million cases, sorry, five million cases. And of course, Carlo Fontana was the person 
who is behind this success, and we're so lucky to have him here with us. And I would like him to tell us about this period. Well, thank you very much, but um, uh, my father deserves all the merit, not me, because in 67 I was only 11. So, I mean, my father would have been arrested if I had worked in his company at that time. Anyhow, in 67 we received an award, our family received an award uh, by Omega. Uh, let's make one step backward. In 66, they decided, their designer decided to produce an elliptical case for their model, Dynamic, which had a steel case, which it was overlaced. Um, and in Switzerland, they did not manage to produce that. Of course, they could make it um, at an artisanal level a few dozens of cases, but we were talking about dozens of thousands of cases. So they came to us. They didn't have much time, and so time was tight. I was small, but I remember my father, who did not just remain in Sesto Calende to find a solution. He started contacting the brazier people producing metal and the aeronautical companies in the Varese area. He organized a technical pool, and they found a solution. The solution was that of obtaining in our factory, in says the Kaleni, a press machine, which was huge. I remember when they installed it, I saw it. It was growing, growing, growing. I saw it. I mean, that press had the size of this room to produce something of this size. It was amazing. So the dynamic watch was launched on the market. The actualized price uh, was the entry price for Omega. Uh, it was about 1,000 euros in terms, present terms. And we built 4 million of those in one year, just to give you an idea of the size of the watch market in the 60s. It was a big success. And uh, the Swiss company showed their appreciation. And then they even became also shareholders in our company, and we developed and started producing for many different watch makes and brands. The Royal Hawk, Bernard Marquet, was produced in its first jumbo version in Switzerland. Collectors know about this very well. It is a wonderful watch, but uh, you look at it and it fails. The case is not tight. So it was so expensive, but it was totally unreliable. So they came to us, and we found the solution for them. And from that moment onwards, Royal Oak became what it is today, also thanks to the Italian distributor. Um, other anecdotes I can tell you about who was that person? Carlo Marchi. So I personally experienced, for instance, Ayek. My father um, came to us with the idea of reproposing the Breguet Type 20 aeronaval model. This is just to give you an idea of how the Swiss work. They have a different mentality. And we always have a chance um, when it is a matter of ideas. So I came to us and showed a drawing of a steel and gold aeronaval watch. And we said, well, look, you're producing a reproduction of a military watch in steel and gold. And the answer was, well, if we do it in steel, it's going to be too cheap. We need to add the gold to make it more prestigious. And I remember I was there. I remember that we said, sorry, we're not going to do that. It is either 100% steel or we don't do it. So Mr. Yak thought about it and I said, OK, go ahead and do it as you like it. And Air Naval Type 20, first series, was a big success. The first series is something I recommend to all collectors because there are some white gold components. So it was not still and yellow gold, but we added some white gold components to make it more prestigious. But that applies to the first series. What well, could you comment on these pictures and these photographs? Carlo Fontana is the first person on the right. 
what happened, why? Well, I will be very, very brief. At that time, I mean, that was the beginning of my career, I was 22, and I was the right arm of Gino Macaluso, who then became the owner of Gerard Brigo and Franco Mantuano. So we all come from the Omega School, and uh, the photograph is not that clear. I think I've got one at home. Uh, my house is like a glacier. Every now and again, it actually blurts out something, and I managed to recover some material. So Tissot had already sponsored a Formula One car and sign. Uh, this had cost them quite a lot of money, but the return in terms of marketing was equal to zero, no economic return. So we met with Franco and Gino Macaluso, and the Swiss told us, look, we didn't understand much of Formula One and cars. Gino Macaluso uh, is connected with Montezemolo, has been a rally European champion. Find a solution, because we want to be there in, in this world. And we said, OK, there are three important brands in Formula One, Ferrari. But we could not work with Ferrari because Mr. Ferrari had a personal relationship with Mr. Aurier. So that was it. The door was closed. All chronometers were provided by Mr. Aurier. Then we had McLaren. That McLaren was flooded by Marlboro dollars. And Marlboro wanted their white and red car. I don't know if you remember, but the original color of McLaren was orange, just like these chairs you're sitting on. But Marlboro imposed the new color. And then there was Lotus. Lotus was actually winning the world competition. So we went to Switzerland, spoke with Mr. Peter, the president, and we said, look, we would like to work together. Yes, yes, start on. And it allowed us to do what we wanted to. So with Macaluso and Franco Bantovano, we went and spoke with Colin Chapman, the owner of Lotus, an extraordinary company for that time. It was a short digression. They used Gosworth 3000 engines of Formula One, and they were tested in a belfry because their racing team was placed in an old abbey. And so they were testing their engines in the belfry, not to bother anybody. So that was fine, together with the bells. So we went and negotiated quickly with Colin Chapman. We went back with a signed contract, 800 million, 800 million for the front part and the wing of the car. So we went back. My father was the president of Omega Italy at that time. I said, we signed the contract. And my father looked at me and said, tomorrow they are going to send you home. They're going to fire you, Macaluso Mantovano. You're mad, 800 million for sponsoring a car? I said, look, I think it is worthwhile. Anyway, we were not fired. And Lotus sported this front part. This car actually did not perform particularly well, Model 80. Anyhow, Tissot that year increased its sales by five times because worldwide the Formula One message had an amazing resonance and the return on investment was huge. So we were very glad about the result. And in the following year, everyone went a different way. So everybody left Omega. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, I would like to add something uh, talking about the success of your company. I remember that you work very much on the materials, materials that are still used today. These are materials that you have investigated. Yes, tantalium, for instance. We were the first ones to use tantalium. Titanium. There's another Omega watch designed by Gerald Gerita that was a titanium model, and they asked us to introduce a, a small golden bezel in titanium. And we found the solution, because titanium at that time uh, fired 
very easily. So to weld it in the gold, you had to use a laser and a vacuum. It was very complicated at that time, but it was a great technological success. And we sold many of those models as well. Great. <coughs> I'd like to speak about your father, who used to say, the next person is an opportunity and a gift with whom you can collaborate. And that was the basis of his life, uh, based on sacrifice. So let's join the hands in memory of that great man. There are many other uh, important uh, realities and companies in Italy who indeed were uh, very important. This is Palmino Monti. Uh, Carlo De Marchi was one of the makers who pushed uh, steel, sports check, Audemars, and uh, indeed, uh, steel was not very much appreciated at that time, but then costs uh, increased a lot. And uh, you indeed uh, might uh, imagine what was the price to uh, make a watch for a top of the range uh, brand. And, but they succeeded. Mario Baiocchi, uh, who uh, uh, founded uh, Paul Picot. Um, then this uh, gentleman, Giorgio uh, uh, Corvo, who, thanks to Reverso, had sold uh, 200 uh, cases in a few months and then had them in the uh, catalog in 1978. We also have Carlo Crocco, who founded Hublot, Marco Mantovani and Fulvio Locci, who founded Lockman in 86. Uh, Mr. Mantovani will speak about that. And uh, uh, we also have uh, Dodi Giussani, who, know, uh, who knows this uh, uh, magazine very well. As a teacher, I uh, learned a lot from this magazine. Teachers uh, were used to speak about uh, subjects to be presented to engineers or salespeople uh, to, to uh, better understand the importance of uh, technology and uh, the role of servicing and overhauling. Yes, uh, we invented a language which is still used today. Uh, at that time, people were uh, well aware that a, a consumer magazine was necessary because we already had uh, trade magazines for the experts of the uh, sector. Augusto Veroni uh, brought the idea uh, to the uh, publishing house owned by my uh, father, who had uh, specialized in computers and things like that. So mm, we had a lot of uh, engineers, and they were not very much passionate about creating a magazine on watches and clocks. My father was a very creative person. But he wanted uh, that magazine, and he decided to be the editor. He did that together with uh, Veroni in 1987. They invented a new language. They spoke about uh, technicalities, but also style. At that time, there were no uh, press offices or, or f pictures. We uh, took the, uh, the uh, pictures and we showed uh, the uh, movements inside, it was much easier at that time. 
as a matter of fact, we uh, talked with the uh, watchmakers in the 90s. The team uh, which had created the magazine uh, decided uh, to uh, go uh, and create a new publishing house. In 1992, they uh, found the Lorologio magazine, which uh, used to publish uh, uh, technical articles. Um, they contained advices and explanations. It was a way of spreading knowledge not for watchmakers, but for common people. Then we started publishing technical articles to describe the problems of mass production watches. I was a teenager at that time, and I used to go to Switzerland to talk with the watchmakers. That was a completely different world. A journalist visited uh, the company making uh, very technical questions. Uh, well, uh, and I, had, I was 19 years old, and they asked very technical questions, and they were uh, impressed. They couldn't understand why I was asking those questions. As a matter of fact, there were, mm, you know, uh, companies uh, like Jäger Le Cult, uh, who indeed uh, they, they had very open minded people and they were available to provide uh, uh, CAD uh, uh, drawings and renderings. Another, uh, I also had a very nice experience with uh, Lange. Uh, when the La Lange was created, we were the first to uh, visit the company, and they explained uh, me uh, the uh, functioning of watches. That is the importance of dissemination. So this language, these explanations were created with uh, the Lorologio in 1992 from an idea of my father and Mr. Giussani, who unfortunately is no longer with us and who left uh, this heritage. The language is still changing. We use different uh, instruments. Uh, we have a protagonist, uh, uh, a YouTuber of watchmaking sitting here in the front row, and many young people. So this is a, a continuous evolution. Thank you very much. Indeed, that was a major contribution to the development of uh, watchmaking. Then we have the Giardiello family uh, launching Sector. They uh, created a new trend, connecting a watch to a story. That also uh, influenced the success of Panerai uh, when uh, Dino Zay relaunched the Panerai watch uh, using it for civil purposes. So uh, Panerai story is unique. Macaluso bought Girard Perigo in 1992. Then uh, the present times. Here I listed many names. I apologize for Maybe someone has not been included. These are very fancy times in the uh, Italian clock and watch making sector. We see here people who made the past and the present history. I'd like to draw your attention uh, on the past decades. I am a teacher, so I have the opportunity to read documents speaking about innovation. Uh, someone said that in 2003, uh, the first uh, watch with uh, carbide uh, K 
case was made uh, in Italy. And the company which made that uh, first case was Lockman by Marco Mantovani. And that is indeed very fascinating. That's why I started uh, uh, researching many other companies. That was the beginning of a new path which was followed by uh, many Swiss companies. In 2004, Richard Millen made the first platina in carbide. Then Audemars Piguet, were, uh, a different forge type of carbide, up to Richard Millet in 2010, uh, manufactured this uh, watch weighing only 20 grams. Another important discovery which I made down there at the end of that lobby a few years ago in the booths there, I saw this. I was shocked at the beginning. I read Made in Italy, I was very much impressed. I asked for a lens and I was impressed by the very good quality. At the beginning of my career, I had wished to see a top of the range uh, watch made in Italy, and there it is. We tried to uh, discover how it was created. It contains unique technical innovations uh, uh, 25,000 alternations per hour, um, second stops. So it's unique uh, uh, with the perlage and the platina. And indeed, uh, it is part of top of the range. And that is an Italian creation. I hope that uh, that could be the beginning of a new renaissance of Italian clock making. Sorry if I interrupt you. We have Benedetto Perrotta here, who is the president and CEO of Poisa. You started not long ago. And you have very important projects. Yes, we have a, a, a major development plan to meet all the uh, requests by these brands to have a, a fully made in Italy uh, device with uh, extremely high performance. I'm sorry I was not informed. Uh, pleased to meet you. Please come and sit here. This is uh, um, handmade, manual, but you have uh, um, an automated mechanism uh, down the line. Yeah, we are, are planning to develop that to meet demands of the different brands. And you make interesting volumes. Yes, uh, it is totally made in Italy, 200 units per month, but by the end of the next year, we would like to make uh, about 500 pieces per month. Per month, incredible. And I hope I, they could come and visit our booth. It's a top quality movement. We worked a lot on the finishings, so what we aim at is at uh, the top of the range. I'd like to conclude with some uh, Italian uh, watch making masters such as Badillo, Papi, uh, Prezioso, Calabrese, Parmigiani, Frank uh, Muller, and Luca Soprana here with us, and Frank Bühler uh, in his 
passport, uh, the name indicated is Francesco, not uh, Frank. Let me conclude with this sentence by an historian of 1806. I uh, produced a description of many clocks demonstrating that Italians uh, uh, were able to be special also in this field with no reason to be jealous of other nations. That was uh, written in 1806. That confirms our DNA and our potentials. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hugo. That was a, a brilliant lecture on the history of watch and clock mailing in Italy. I'm sure I'm, I'm afraid I have forgotten many persons. We have the son of Pagani here uh, from Washeron Constantin. So the Italian importers have always been very important for the switch watch, uh, watch making industry. Now I would like to invite uh, Marco Mantovani. Uh, we uh, saw the first uh, carbide uh, case uh, produced in the uh, Genesee manufacturing plant. So how uh, did Lockman uh, start? What about uh, conducting such a company in Italy? Well. I, I would not start from the beginning because it would be a very long story. Um, the uh, made in Italy element is very important. I'm lucky because I work with the Nietzsche and uh, the names I saw on the slide uh, stir many uh, emotions. Uh, Judges is bought by Lockman and um, the Leandri uh, remained with us as long as they could. I could work with Carlo. So his companies worked for all the major brands uh, Audemars, Hublot, Vacheron. Uh, in Italy, the Swiss watches were produced. When the Swiss were not able to make something, they came to Italy to have it done. Genesis have always uh, produced as a, a subcontractor, and the companies by the Ricallo families, they produce half a million watches per year. Oza uh, bought the cases and mm, hallmarked them, and the Leandri bought the Oza movements for their watches. These are major numbers. We were born as designers, and in the end, we developed production in Italy. Major companies were in Italy. Uh, there were wonderful skills here. so. I can say what Carlo used to say, the great success of the Swiss is something which was not unintended, or rather which is unintended. Excellent companies uh, in Italy. I could tell you many anecdotes, and this is true also for marketing, for ideas, great successes, always came where there was an Italian hand, also in Swiss companies. I had the opportunity to work with great uh, masters like Macaluso or, or Croco, who was a, a partner for many years. But at that time, for Italians, it was easier to set up a company and develop a brand defining themselves as Swiss, but they were Italians. Some of the names mentioned by Ugo are part of my uh, professional history. We made a different choice. 
we uh, decided to define ourselves as Italians, which we were. At that time, the Swiss who bought uh, in Italy, where uh, labor uh, was uh, at a lower cost, they discovered China. Many uh, Italian experts uh, had to go to China to train engineers there, and we developed our work uh, as subcontractors to enhance the Lockman brand. So the Made in Italy in that way was a bit uh, lost. So there was a transition to the Far East. This does not necessarily mean that the quality is lower, but as a matter of fact, the, uh, that happened uh, uh, before the age uh, the internet. So we should not cancel uh, the culture of watchmaking of the past decades uh, till the year 2000. The uh, Italian manufacturing was and still is very important. So the family of Carlo had many uh, plants. They were sold uh, to Omega and Bulgari last year. Uh, the Swiss don't like to advertise the fact that uh, their products are made in Italy. And uh, as subcontractors, we have always worked for them, but we were uh, ranking first in everything. Maybe something was not uh, clear. Uh, uh, Orology was one of, uh, was the first magazine in the world, in the world. Yes, then the Germans uh, came by translating Italian magazines. We do, uh, we are passionate. I met Ugo and I uh, understood why because that comes from people who made the history of the world in many sectors. This is part of the DNA. When I met Sandro, we uh, indeed understood that we share the same passion. The first time I entered in Rocca, Carlo had a great idea to create the first luxury chain of watches in Italy. So the first time I uh, went to Rocca to propose the first line of Lockman, and we had just separated from Hublot, and I was lucky because I met an extraordinary person, Mr. Bonaccorso, Carlo Bonaccorso, special person who immediately understood the potentials. In uh, two seconds, Carlo understood what to do, and they were the first to buy the Lockmont or the whole luxury chain. It has always been a great success, supported by a, a good friendship. That never happened with the Swiss. I worked with many Swiss companies, but that um, synteny, that ability to uh, foresee trends and so on. So we uh, owe a lot to uh, the Swiss, but we should not forget our tradition. I see that today there are many companies of different sizes who say that they are Italian. That is key. In the past, everything was done to uh, indicate made in Geneva. But we also have a part of Switzerland, which is Italian. But I think that uh, watchmaking is part of our heart. As for the uh, OISE project, and I am uh, privileged to be part of that, is that we can uh, write Made in Italy on the watches. We, uh, indeed, know that the Swiss, in order to protect their work, um, indeed uh, had a rule passed uh, for the customs 
that uh, if the movement uh, was Swiss, made in Switzerland, had to be uh, put. In Italy, we always um, were contented of uh, uh, subcontracting, contracting. so putting made in Italy in our watches is a great satisfaction. Thank you very much. I remember that you had the courage uh, to tell that you are based in the Elba Island, which is a very small island. As for innovation, I was reminded that uh, you worked a lot about the tonneau shape. You were, you know, pioneers in recovering that. And the uh, watches were set diamonds. That was one of, you, of your creative ideas. Italians, you know, have always been like that, a creative, sometimes for subcontractors, sometimes for others. Carlo. We talked about importers. I interviewed uh, Carlo Leonardi, who was Zenith importer, who uh, uh, told us how things worked. You visited the company, made your selection, and also uh, gave some suggestions. That was the time when the Daytona watch was uh, getting trendy. So he uh, took an old Zenith watch, who was then named uh, De Luca, the name of his colleague. Then uh, things in the market were begun to change. You send me uh, a very interesting uh, document, uh, which I would like to mention here today. Well, the Italian market in the 80s was the third market in the world and the first in Europe. We had uh, the US and Hong Kong. When you say Hong Kong, Today, we refer to China. Their uh, market was the Japanese one, and the third was the Italian. We were very close to Switzerland, and still are, and then we are the th were the third market, and the producers considered us very important partners. And we were uh, uh, lucky because that allowed us to guide the trends. Luxury items are like that, not because they are very expensive or rare. These are consequences of luxury good. This is so because you are uh, extremely satisfied and happy when you are very, very happy because you owe an item. That is a luxury item. There was a, a, a background culture ready to accept a certain product. People were more knowledgeable. If you hear uh, the music of Mozart and that of Fedes, uh, with due respect to Fedes, uh, you think are the same? People say it's an issue of taste. No, it's an issue of levels. Wines are different. It's a different of uh, question of uh, being knowledgeable of culture. So we have to work on the culture of people who want to keep luxury. Otherwise, we are lo hopeless. 
going back to Formula One. When you run, or drive, sorry, if the, the engine is good, I mean, you uh, indeed uh, are in the front line. You might have uh, the best uh, chassis, but if uh, the engine is not good, there's nothing to do. So we have a, a, a good uh, starting base. And congratulations for this gentleman who uh, produced that wonderful item, Sandro. We have the opportunity to go back to a major role of made in Italy in uh, watchmaking. We have many brands. I see Italo Fontana here, creator of u -Bot. I uh, was informed that you opened up uh, an outlet in Madison Avenue. What about the the possibility to relaunch the Made in Italy watches. Uh, we are Italian, so uh, we are indeed, we love our being Italian and we are proud of that. We are ranking second to no one and that is a very fascinating project. We have been able to make the history today uh, the greatest collectors uh, watches and are uh, Italian. We are awarded because of our good quality. This is something that we have plus our creativity that is key to create fascinating products. Well, all these things combined can create a, a winning product. You told me that the idea that a component is made in China is not an issue. Things have to be made well. I do believe that uh, the origin, well, uh, is not really the issue. What is important is top quality manufacturing, love and passion. Don't forget that uh, we also have Japanese watch makers, they indeed conquered the market. We uh, Italians have been subcontractors uh, for a long time. Uh, there we have uh, makers with a strong identity and uh, we uh, should uh, do the same. I fully agree. And there is no reason why we should not achieve that. And as for culture and intuition, you are known as a person who can indeed foresee trends and what can be successful in the market. Why do you have that talent? I don't have that talent, I think, but I follow my heart. So when there is something I like, something which uh, stir my feelings and emotions, this is what I follow. Love and passion are the basis of everything. And when the quality is good, results are granted. But uh, we should also have knowledge and culture, knowing the product, indeed. 
that comes from the experience and the time you devoted uh, to search for certain objects. I mean, when you started your career, as we all did, um, you have everything to learn. You know, exams are never end. So we have many Italians here, thanks to the exhibitors of Watches of Italy, which was uh, uh, an event created in Tortona, uh, attending also the uh, Vicenza edition to contribute uh, to the development of the uh, uh, watch uh, exhibition. He is the creator of Watches of Italy. Can you talk about that idea? Good afternoon. That idea came uh, from the fact that I come from a family of collectors, starting from my grandparents. I attended the uh, School of Engineering, so for me, mechanics is not only performance, but it uh, should also tell about art crafts, which is intended to produce objects with measure time, but which have an arts element. Italy is the home country of beauty, and we do have a certain approach to uh, technique starting from Renaissance. Uh, so we are uh, fans of what is beautiful and functional. So let's rediscover this national pride to believe in our flag. So I uh, got in touch with all the friends which I had to meet uh, for the exhibitions. We have always been divided. Just think of the uh, towns of the Renaissance, uh, and every uh, city could create very good quality, but uh, uh, only limited to their community. So there, are, there is a lot of uh, variance in Italy. So those who produce something in uh, the area of Milan do a, a, a work different from those produced in Naples. If we join forces and work like a single team, we can present our model of beauty and culture in watch making without ranking second to other Swiss, French, German or Japanese masters. So I created a chat of uh, friends and we created the Watches of Italy. Um, we had 4,000 visits in the past edition. I talked with the staff of Italian Exhibition Group. We have been uh, performing in the business to consumers so we could collaborate with the trade fair. So this is the first uh, uh, event that we organize. And for the future, we would like uh, to uh, promote watchmaking culture so that we can make the world understand that we have a lot to do and to give. Well, we are the pioneers, but we are not afraid of being united. Let's join forces under a single flag and try to disseminate that message. Collaboration is the only way to work because indeed a team is always better than a single person.
would like to congratulate uh, the uh, team of e, sorry, IEG for working started uh, in 2020 with a small event on vintage where well, they were able to create a wonderful community and uh, now we are involving the B2B approach stimulating also small companies there is a surprise there are many people from Tuscany There is something burning under the ashes. <laughs> you know, love moves the universe, and love for watch making make us uh, united. So we are working on an uh, idea. You're not in a hurry. Tell us something. We <laughs> are waiting for this surprise. Creativity, love, and heart. That is it. We'll see. How long shall we wait? Time is magic. We will take all the time which is needed. We are working with passion and love. So we hope to learn something about that uh, next September. Let's hope. Let's hope. So thank you very much. Thank you all, all for being here. Thank you very much for your interesting uh, presentations. All the best to the Made in Italy watch making sector and its rebirth, renaissance. Thank you all.